Today we're going to focus on single cell DRAP-seq. So to start with, DRAP-seq is basically RNA-seq at the single cell level, looking specifically at mRNA. So we talked about RNA-seq last week. That's when you look at mRNA sequences in a sample and get an idea of what RNAs are present in your whole sample. The difference here is that we're looking at single cells rather than all of our pooled cells and that we're looking specifically at mRNA rather than all of the RNAs in the cell. So just to walk through this slowly, with RNA-seq, let's say that you start with one plate of cells for each sample, okay? So this one plate of cells is going to receive whatever treatment you're interested in or whatever condition you're interested in, and then you're going to extract all of the RNA from that one plate of cells and you're going to pool it. So this is pooled RNA. That means that every piece of RNA that was in here is now in this sample. And then you're going to send that sample to RNA-seq, to sequencing. So this is basically giving you an idea of the bulk RNA in your sample. It's saying that on a global level, when I treat an entire plate of cells with my condition, on a global level, these are the changes that happen. So let's say that I find out that gene A is elevated afterwards. That means that gene A is elevated in enough cells in this plate. So let's say it's elevated in like, you know, 70% of the cells in this plate. And that means that when I look at this global situation, I'm going to see that gene A is up. But it doesn't mean that gene A is elevated in every single cell in my sample. It just means that on a global level, there's an increase in gene A across all of the cells together. So this is looking at all your cells together. It sort of pools the sample and tells you that in a broad way, on a global level, this is what's happening. Drop-seq is RNA-seq at the single cell level, like we said. So now you have one plate of cells and you have, you know, all of your cells in this plate. And there you've exposed them to some condition that you're interested in. But now instead of doing pooling the RNA and sending it off for sequencing, you're actually going to take every single cell individually and you're going to send every single cell for sequencing individually. So rather than being a bulk measure, this is the individual measure of every single gene in every single cell. So now if I look at gene A, I would actually be able to see that gene A is up in 70% of the cells, like we said before, and that 30% of the cells maybe actually have gene A down. And maybe there's some difference between these groups of cells. Maybe these cells are cells that are differentiated and these cells are cells that are more stem-like. And maybe that's why we're seeing a difference in how they express gene A. So it sort of gives us more information at a higher resolution than this RNA-seq would have given us because in RNA-seq we would have just seen, oh, gene A is up. But here we know gene A is up in these cells and it's down in these cells. So it allows us to see really cell by cell what is happening to our gene of interest. So now that we understand a little bit about how DROP-seq is different than RNA-seq and how it allows that higher resolution, we can talk a little bit about the pipeline. So last week we talked about the RNA-seq pipeline. And the RNA-seq pipeline, the way we talked about it, is that you set up your screen and you send it for sequencing. Then you look at the quality of your sequencing files. Then you look at sample quality. So here you're going to generate your count table. And then you're going to look at sample quality. And then you're going to do your actual analysis algorithm. So this tells you your full change and your p-value. And then we're going to generate our visualizations. So these are the visualizations. And then we're going to identify genes that we're interested in. So like I talked about last week, all sequencing applications have very similar pipelines. So no matter what kind of seek I'm doing, it's going to be somewhat similar. I'm going to send a sample for sequencing. I'm going to evaluate the quality of that sequencing file. And I'm going to use some sort of computational algorithm to define which genes have changed and how significant those changes are. And then I'm going to be able to identify genes of interest. So 
the overall pipeline of DropSeq is not that different. There's just a few key differences that we need to take into account. So one is that when we set it up and send it for sequencing, our setup is a little bit different than before because we have such an increase in sample number. We're going from one to one million cells or one million samples. So the setup has to be just a little bit different to account for that. But then we still send it to an Illumina sequencer after we've set up our samples appropriately. And that Illumina sequencer is still going to give us a FASTQ file and we're still going to run quality checks on that FASTQ file with FASTQC exactly the same way. And then this FASTQC and sequencing file, now that we know that the quality is good, is going to generate a count file as well. This count file is going to be just a little bit different, but very much the same idea. And then we're going to be able to assess our sample quality which again is the same idea of looking for similarity and making sure that your replicates cluster appropriately, that samples are behaving as you expect. Then you're gonna do your data analysis and the algorithms here change a little since we're using a different, um, a different number of samples. We need to account for the larger number of samples. Our visualizations change slightly and we'll go over these new types of plots. We can also do heat maps here, however, and those are something that you're very familiar with at this point. And then we can again identify specific genes of interest from this analysis and these plots, because this gives us the same sort of idea of like what is changing and how significant is that change. And that's really what we need to know anytime we're trying to pick genes of interest. So you can see that this is very similar to RNA-seq. So I just want to pause here and say that if you don't understand RNA-seq or if you haven't watched the RNA-seq video, it would be a good idea to go back and watch this video so that you really understand RNA-seq because DropSeq really builds on many of those concepts. Okay, so we've talked a little about the differences. Now I want to walk through step-by-step step for DropSeq and its pipeline and make sure we really understand the things that are changing. So this slide is from the original paper that described DropSeq. It's their figure explaining how DropSeq works. And I want you to understand that if you're just starting out and you're just trying to understand how these experiments work, you don't need to worry too much about the exact you know, fluidics and exactly what's going on in this setup. It's a little bit complicated and the important thing is that you understand the main ideas of what is going on here. So let's start at the beginning. So for the first step in your experiment, you're going to perform whatever experimental condition you are interested in. So that's right here. And this is just like RNA-seq. You can do all the same things. You could do cells, you could do animals, you could do human samples, you can do conditions that involve treatments or time or both. Um, so you can really do the same range of experiments that you would have done with RNA-seq. It's not that you're limited in your sample in any way. The important thing though is that then once you've done your treatment and you've looked at whatever you're interested in, that you turn the sample into cells. So you have to isolate cells from whatever sample. So let's say that you did this in a mouse brain, that would be fine, but then you would have to take the brain and turn it into a single cell suspension to put it into your DropSeq machine. So like you can see here, it says cells from suspension. These go in through one tube in your DropSeq machine. And then the second thing that's really important is that you add in your beads or your microparticles. And these beads are really important because they allow for barcoding. So every bead is going to have a different barcode on it. So you can imagine that this has a red barcode, this has a blue barcode, and this has a green barcode. So every single cell that you're, every single bead that you put through this machine is uniquely barcoded. And that's what allows you to know which cell had which mRNA sample. So at the end, you can match it all back up and say that this sequence came from this cell, which came from this condition. So that barcoding is a really, really important piece of what this bead is doing. The other thing that these beads will allow is that they have the components necessary for the PCR reaction. 
So once the correct barcode and the correct RNA has been attached to the bead, it actually performs the PCR reaction right there for you. So imagine that we put these beads in here and we put our cells in up top like we talked about. They're gonna come together in the tubing along with the oil. So you put oil through this to form droplets and you're gonna form this droplet and every droplet has both a bead and a cell in it. Now, of course, when you put this through together, you're not necessarily going to get every single bead and droplet into the same um, place. So you're gonna have some droplets that don't have anything in them. You're gonna have some droplets that only have a cell or only have a bead. And you're gonna have some droplets that are perfect and have exactly what you want, which is a cell and a bead together. So these are the droplets that you actually are going to use. For example, that one, this one is another great one. So you can see that you have to generate a lot of droplets in order to get a good number of droplets that have what you actually need, which is this situation where the cell and the bead are together. And remember the bead is what's giving us our barcode. So here, this is giving us our barcode. And the cell is the one cell that we want to analyze and get its sequencing information. So we have to have both of them together in one droplet because the droplet is what's holding the cell in place and the bead in place to provide that cell with the barcode and with the necessary reagents to perform the PCR reaction. So once you have this droplet formed correctly with everything in it, the cell gets lysed. So now we're gonna X our cell, and instead all of the RNA that was in the cell is going to get attached to the bead. So now this bead has barcode on it, and it has RNA on it from the cell that we're interested in analyzing, okay? So this is a key step, and this is why your bead and your droplets and your cell all have to be in the same place together in order to allow this to happen. From this step, we're going to move on and we're going to finally break our droplets because now you can see that everything in your droplet is attached together. So we no longer need the droplet to keep things in the same place. Everything is attached to the bead. So we can now break the droplet because everything is together and attached and our reverse transcription is going to happen. And this is what generates the cDNA, because as you remember, what we talked about last time is that you have to have cDNA for sequencing applications. And so we'll often generate cDNA, which is the DNA complement of the RNA that we're looking at in order to do sequencing. So this part is very important because it makes the cDNA from the mRNA. This generates what's called stamps. So now we have our beads and just like before, these beads have a barcode attached, but they also have the cDNA attached for the mRNA that we're interested in that we attach to the beads right here. So with our bead, with our barcode and our cDNA, every one of these units has everything we need to perform a single cell sequencing reaction. So now we can PCR these because we need to amplify them. You'll remember that before you send anything for sequencing, it has to be amplified for the sequencer to work. So we amplify each one. So this is one set, this is another set, this is another set. And then we can finally send it to sequencing. And this sequencing will allow us ultimately to map every mRNA to its cell and gene. So we'll have levels for every gene and every single cell of the pool that we send, which is really quite amazing. Like if you think about it, Normal RNA-seq can give you, you know, over 17,000 genes information. And this is 17,000 genes in every single cell of a giant sample. So it could be a million cells that you sent for sequencing, and now you have 17,000 genes information for a million cells. That's a huge amount of information, and it's really incredible that we can look at things at that resolution. So this is a very new tool and a very, very interesting and amazing tool that allows us to have a lot of new information that we wouldn't have had 10 years ago. So now we can really understand every single cell at the single cell level 
and draw conclusions about our overall cell population as well as every single cell individually. So the setup is complicated and the main things, if you didn't understand all of it, the main things to make sure you understand are that these droplets are very important to form because they contain the cell that you want to analyze and the bead that has the barcode information and the reaction information. And so together, once those have been sort of encapsulated in this droplet, that's what allows you to generate the mRNA, generate the cDNA, and perform the PCR for sequencing all together on just one cell at a time. So just remember, the reason it's called DropSeq is because we use droplets, and the droplets have to be barcoded, and that's what the beads are for. And then they have to contain a reaction, and again, the beads and the cell allow that. Okay, so now that we understand the setup a little, there is this great video that you can go ahead and find if you look this up, and it kind of shows you the droplets going through the fluidic system, and you can see droplets coming in here, one right here, and then they form these final droplets that have both the beads and the cells. So these are your beads and cells coming through, and this is the final round droplet with both of them. And this is a picture from our lab where you can see the final droplets. So these large things are the droplets, and within them you can see cells and beads together. So now that we've talked about setup, the next step is you're gonna set up your screen, right? So you're gonna do the droplet thing we just talked about. You're gonna send it for actual sequencing. And then like we talked about with RNA-seq, you're going to get a FASTQ file out. And the first thing you do with any FASTQ file is you check the quality with FASTQC. And as a reminder, this is meant to be a way to check the quality of your actual sequencing. So at this point, you're not really looking at individual genes or quality of replicates. You're just asking, is this sequencing a sequencing that I can trust? As a reminder, your FASTQ file is going to have a bunch of information in it, really everything you need to understand the sequence and its quality. And so it's going to have a label, it's going to have the actual sequence, and it's going to have quality scores for every single sequence. And it's going to tell you how good it is, how good that sequence is, so how confident it is in the sequence that I gave you. For more information on FASTQC files, you can check out the RNA-seq video where we walk through FASTQC step by step. But for now, all we're going to say is that it's important to check that your FASTQC file looks good and that your sequence passes the quality requirements in order to proceed. So once we know that our FASTQC looks good, then we're at the point in our setup. So we do setup, we send it for sequencing, we do the FASTQC with our FASTQ file that we get. And then we're at the point where if our FASTQC looks good, we can use the sequencing files to generate our count table. So this is the table where we actually summarize for every gene and every cell, how much is there in the sample. So the original lab that developed DropSeq also published a pipeline that allows you to take your sequencing file. So this is your entire sequencing file. And like we talked about, you have hundreds of millions of reads and then you align that to the genome. So this is your actual, here you have your HG38 human genome, and you're aligning all these sequences to that genome, and that allows you to figure out which gene it is that the sequence references. And then you can count how many of them you have, and that's what allows you to generate this count table. So this algorithm is something you can implement in R or in Python. It's a little bit complicated, and I don't want you to worry about exactly how to code it. The lab does provide a good walkthrough of how to use it if you needed to, but I really just want you to understand how it works. So I want you to understand that you're taking all of your sequences, that you are matching them up to the genome, and that match allows you to figure out which gene you're looking at, and the number of matches allows you to figure out how many of that gene you have. And then you generate a similar count table so just like in RNA-seq where we had a count table, we also will have a count table for DropSeq that looks more like this. 
And this is also called a digital expression matrix. It's also called a count table. It contains the counts for every gene and for every cell in your sample. So let's look at more detail for this count table. So last time we talked about the RNA-seq count table. And we said that you're going to have all of your genes along the sides. You're going to have gene A, B, C going down to like gene N. And you're going to have all of your samples. So you have three replicates for your control and three replicates for your treatment and so on. You would have three replicates for any sample that you sent. And for every single sample, remember that this is a bulk sample. So you've pooled the entire sample and generated one count for one gene you would have a count for every single gene that you sent in. So one count per gene per sample. For drop seek, you're gonna have one count per gene per sample per cell. So every cell in your sample gets its own count for every gene. So that means that now, instead of having just one count table, you're gonna have multiple count tables and for every single sample you send in, so let's say this is my T3 sample, so it's the third replicate of my treatment, I'm gonna have every cell in that sample going up to one million cells, and every gene in that sample going to at least 17,000 genes, probably more, and then I'm gonna have a count for every single condition. So for my third treatment sample, for every cell in that sample, I'm going to have every gene counted up. And I'm going to know that in cell one for gene A, I have five copies and so on. So it provides a much, much higher resolution. And it's very important to have your counts in this format for each sample in order to analyze them. So your cells are always gonna be the columns and your genes are always gonna be the rows. So now that we have this count table, you're going to basically clean up and assess quality of count tables. So again, this is just like RNA-seq, where in RNA-seq we looked at sample similarity, et cetera. You're going to take a minute in your drop-seq pipeline to clean everything and check the quality before you continue to figuring out which genes are elevated and which genes you should be interested in. So, this cleanup process is definitely complicated and it's not something that you would have to implement if you were not analyzing your drop seek by yourself. The package to do this is called Surat and it's a great package that you can definitely check out if you wanted to do this. It provides a really good walkthrough of how to do it step by step. But here I really just want to summarize the major steps involved in this cleanup. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at all your accounts and look at the distribution of those counts. And you basically just want to make sure that they follow along a logical distribution, that there's no crazy outliers in your distribution of counts. So if you have a bunch of genes that were zero for some reason, those would be outliers and you should get rid of them so that you can have a good clean data set to analyze. So you're removing any outliers in your data set and you're checking the distributions. Sometimes for drop seek, we will isolate cells from animals. And when we do that, it's really important to separate the species. So if I implanted a tumor into a mouse and then I was analyzing it by drop seek, I would want to make sure that there were no mouse cells contaminating my sample. So I would get rid of all the mouse cells and keep all the human cells in my sample. And Surat offers ways for you to do that and make sure that you're looking at the right species. Sometimes it might be interesting to look at both, in which case you would want to make sure that you separate the sample and look at what's appropriate. The next thing you're going to do is normalize the data and transform it. And these are simple functions within the package that just allow you to make the matrix more manageable and allow the rest of the analysis to occur. And then finally, you're going to think about how many clusters you want to introduce into your analysis. So we'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. But the major things to understand here are that you are cleaning up your samples so that you can do all of the necessary analysis because you have such a high number of reads and so many samples that any dirt in the data will really mess up your analysis moving forward.
Okay, so let's talk about that last clustering piece. So if you remember last time for RNA-seq, we talked about PCA plots. So this is part of your quality assessment after you have your count tables. And we talked about them as a way to assess similarity. And if you remember, our plots look something like this, where we would have three dots clustered here and perhaps three more clustered here. And this was PC1 and this was PC2. And this was just a way to say, okay, these three samples are more similar to each other than they are to these three samples because they're clustered together in space. So more similar means closer together on your PCA plot. And now we're gonna expand this idea to be on the single cell level. So this is exactly what we did before, except that now we have far more samples to plot because now instead of sending three pooled samples, we sent like 1 million samples. So we have 1 million dots to plot in space and see whether they cluster together or not. So this plot here is another PCA plot, and this is just an example. So I have not told you what sample all of these dots correspond to. I'm just showing you how they cluster in space. So you could imagine by just looking at the clustering that perhaps these are all from one sample, these are all from a second sample, and these are all from a third sample. Because again, they're gonna cluster together in space. And that's what tells me that they are similar to each other, okay? So ideally, we would color these dots and we would say, okay, these are sample one, these are sample two, these are sample three, and they all cluster in space appropriately. So we know that they're all appropriately similar within themselves, but different to each other. This PCA plot is exactly the same as before. It's the same idea, it's just expanded in the number of samples. Just remember that you're looking for clustering in space. But this is a 2D PCA, so we're only looking at PC1 and PC2. We're only looking at two ways in which the samples could be different. For this many samples, it would be useful to actually look at all of the different PCs. So we'd want to look at maybe 20 different ways in which these samples could be different. So this plot allows us to look at all 20 PCs together. And it basically represents each PC with a line. And the straighter up the line is, for example, this line or these lines, the more significant the difference is among the samples. So straighter line means more significant difference. And you can see that because we have our p-values written here. And you can see how these PCs that are straighter up show a more significant difference than these PCs. So this p-value is a p-value of how different is this sample along this dimension. So if I look at one way of difference, which remember PC1 is the most important way of difference between your samples, we see that it is very, very significant. And so that line is straight up in our plot here. So this just allows you to visualize all 20 PCs together so you can get an idea of which PCs are very important. And the number of PCs that are important or significant is the number of clusters you should have in your graph. So it's the number of unique samples that are clustering individually that you would want to look at individually for genes. So to say that another way, the point of single cell analysis is to understand how cells behave at a single cell level and to group those cells together and understand how they behave in certain clusters. So if I sent three samples to sequencing and I sampled every single cell in those samples, then I ended up with this PCA plot where I see my three samples. And then I would wanna know that within these clusters, what is the gene signature of these clusters? So how does each cluster look and how is it different from the other cluster? And that's what understanding this PCA plot lets me do. It tells me how many ways are they different. So in this case, it looks like there are five or six really significant PCs 
So six ways in which they're different. So if I cluster them to six groups, I should be able to see the six differences that matter. So overall, the number of different significant PCs is the number of clusters that we should be able to generate and that we should look at to see the differences among the different clusters of cells. So hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, there's a lot of reading you can do on the PCs. Um, and this course here provides a nice overview of what's going on. But even if you don't understand it, the important point to take away is that the number of significant PCs is the number of clusters you should generate moving forward. So now that we've understood how many clusters of cells we need to make, we can generate our actual visualizations. So the main visualization of a single cell experiment is a TCME plot or more recently, a UMAP plot. At a very basic level, these plots are similar. They are slightly different in how they perform the projection and UMAP is considered the preferred version now because it handles, you know, it handles bias better and it handles your cells better and it gives you a more efficient solution. But essentially they're doing the same thing. So what they're doing is that both of them are going to show clustering of your cells in space based on their genetic characteristics. So up till now, it sounds kind of like a PCA. It's going to cluster the cells in space based on their counts. But the other thing it adds is that it also bases it on their actual sample source. So now the clusters that you're seeing aren't just similarity. They're also where the cell came from. So if we look at these clusters, for example, this green cluster here is going to be your B cells. So it's clustering all the B cells together. And this, you know, tan color here is going to be your CD14 cells. These purple tiny ones here are your dendritic cells. These are your megakaryocytes. And so it's really trying as much as possible to keep all the cells that are from the same source together but it's also trying to give you a visualization of how similar those cells are. And so you can see that there's some bleed here because these cells are probably very similar in their genetic characteristics, even though they are from separate groups. So this plot is giving you, it's plotting every cell. So you did a single cell experiment. So you're looking at every cell on this plot and it's giving you a projection of this is the group of cells. So these are all from the same group or the same sample. And this is how similar they are to each other. So this plot is useful for a number of things. So you could imagine that now, if you superimposed the gene expression information on this plot, which we will look at in a second, you can use the clusters and the gene expression to see what cell type certain genes tend to be expressed in. So let's say that I looked at a certain gene and it was very, very highly expressed in this group here, then I would know that CD14 monocytes very strongly express that gene. It can also allow us to identify biomarkers so we can compare, for example, all the gene expression in this group and look at, okay, these 10 genes are up in this group consistently across every single cell. That tells us that those 10 genes are likely a biomarker for that cell type. So we can use those genes to identify that cell type. And then finally, if we take this group and this blue group here and perhaps this blue group here and we compare them to each other, it would allow us to analyze what genes are different between these two groups. And that would tell us what signatures are for each of these groups and what genes matter to make this group this group and this group be this group. So these two groups are, this is NK cells and this is monocytes. And so if we identified which genes are different, it would tell us which genes make a monocyte a monocyte and which genes make um, NK cells into NK cells. So this is a very powerful analysis because it gives us so much information. We can do everything we did in RNA-seq where we looked at global gene expression changes but we can also do so many other analyses when we can understand a cell by cell and see really cell by cell what is the main gene that signifies this cell or what is the main gene that identifies this cluster 
or what are the genes that make these clusters really different, even though these cells may be started from the same population or the same sample. So the other point I wanna make is that I talked about how it groups the cells based on where they came from. But the thing to remember is that this could have all been one sample. So I could have just taken like some random human tissue that contained multiple different types of cells and put it through single cell and it would have identified all of the different types of cells within my sample and separated them out for me so that I could see that, okay, like if I submitted one skin sample, it actually has all of these immune cells in it and it has fibroblasts in it and maybe it has some keratinocytes in it and this single cell analysis would have separated all those cells out and shown me gene expression patterns for each group of cells individually and each cell individually. So that's a very powerful tool. Okay, so now let's look at specific plot types that we might use. So the basis of all of these plots is still gonna be our UMAP, our TSNE plot. And this plot is again gonna tell us basically which group is which group. So it tells us this tan group you're seeing here corresponds to this type of cell. This red group you're seeing here corresponds to this type of cell and so on. So this plot is your reference for how the groups look and what cell type they correspond to. So once you know what cell type you're looking at, there's a number of ways to look at the genes that you're actually interested in. So remember, again, these colors are the groups of cells, the types of cells that we're looking at. And these plots are the gene expression. So it's showing you two different things. This color does not match with this color here. But both plots are giving you important information to interpret. So if you imagine that these are numbered 0 through 7, so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then you can match these numbers up to this plot. So this group 0 here is going to be your CD4 cells, and this group 5 is going to be NK cells, and so on. So that tells you that within each group, if we plot the expression of NKG7, which is our gene we're interested in, we can see how it behaves within each group of cells. So it is very elevated, for example, in group three, which we know is our CD8 T cells. So this just allows you to see across each group, how is the gene expression looking? It's also very elevated in our NK cells, which are blue, and so you can see that as well. Um, in this case, the colors actually have been corresponded, but always be careful about that because sometimes they are not corresponded. So you want to make sure you actually match up the group that you're looking at on the x-axis and then look at your gene expression level so you can figure out which group has elevated gene expression for the gene of interest. So for PF4, we can see clearly that PF4 is really only expressed in our last group, which is the megakaryocytes. So this allows you to together interpret both how your groups look and how they're clustering and also how specific genes are expressed within those groups. So these are called violin plots and they're a very common visualization of single cell data. Another really common visualization of single cell data is to actually take this cluster plot and then superimpose your gene expression upon it. So here, instead of matching the number of the group, you're actually going to match the shape. So here we can see that this shape is very colored in. And so that tells us, based on this heat map next to it, that there's high expression of this gene, MS4A1, within this group. And if we match this to this, we know that that group is this group, which corresponds to our B cells. You can also see, for example, that PPBP goes really high in this group, which is this group, which is our megakaryocytes. CD14 appears to be really strong in CD14 monocytes, which does make sense because they're called CD14 monocytes. And so you're basically matching shape to the shape of the TCNE plot. And then you're looking at how blue it is for the expression of the gene you're interested in. 
So this is another very common visualization. And the nice thing about it is that it allows you to see all the information in one plot. So it allows you to see the groups in one plot and how they're clustering. And it also allows you to see expression in the same plot and see how high that expression is in each group. So it's a very nice visual of everything that's going on together. Whereas the violin plots are really nice for getting that quantitative feel of what's going on, but they're less nice for understanding how each group looks within your plot itself. So it gives you a really quantitative measure, but it doesn't show you that nice visual of the groups with the gene expression. And then finally, the last visualization we're going to talk about is the heat map. So this is not a gene-specific cluster plot. It's a heat map. I apologize about that. Um, and this allows you to do the same thing. So you're looking at your groups, which are numbered 0 through 7, and you're going to match the groups up to this top bar here. And then it allows you to see every single gene that you're interested in. So these are all of your genes down the side. So you might have made a list of 50 that you're interested in for whatever reason. Maybe they're the top 50 genes in your data set or they're 50 genes that define a certain signature, whatever it may be. These are 50 genes that you might have decided you're interested in looking at. So you plot them down the side and you plot your groups across the top. And then you can really see in every single group for every gene, what is the expression of my gene of interest. So this is a more global scale thing. It's averaging your groups together to some degree, um, but it is giving you every single cell here across the top. It's every cell across the top. And then based on the colors, you can kind of see that group one tends to have these genes expressed highly. And perhaps like group five tends to have these genes expressed highly. So this is a nice way to visualize the overall information, but it's hard to get really granular information about each cell and each gene from this. It's more useful to see the global picture of what's going on with specific genes and specific groups. So to sort of wrap things up, let's talk about why we might use DropSeq over RNA-seq. So RNA-seq is really useful for understanding your bulk changes in expression. It's easy to send out. There's a lot of analysis platforms available, and it allows you to look at all RNA types, not just mRNA. So it's useful for just a global understanding of what is going on, especially in samples where you know that perhaps there's not going to be too much heterogeneity. It's going to be very, you know, a homogeneous sample. You just want to know how expression is changing. DropSeq, on the other hand, is useful for really high sensitivity, high resolution understanding of compartments within a single sample. So for something like GBM, where we've talked about how it's highly heterogeneous, it would be useful to know that within one GBM sample, what are all the different things that are going on cell by cell. And that's why DropSeq is something that we find very useful because it allows us to really capture all of those different things that are going on. The flip side of it, though, is that it does require custom fluidics and a knowledge of the analysis platforms. There's not as many open source things out there that you can just use without too much coding knowledge. And it does allow examination of only mRNA at this point. You cannot look at all the different RNA types. So today we've talked about DropSeq. We've given a general overview of how it works and how to set it up. We've talked about the analysis pipeline and how you walk through understanding what all of it means. And finally, we've talked about some visualizations and how to interpret them. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out here. Um, please feel free to also follow us on Twitter if you want to see more of this data. Um, thank you so much for listening again.